We should probably get on to the actual topic of the conversation. The subject at hand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As it were. Which is the the movie. Uh, we, we were talking just before we started recording, I think, about the fact that this movie is not as well known. It's It seems to be quite well known in the circles where we move. You know, I certainly when I say to people, oh, there's this movie, The Changeling, with George, yeah. and people go, oh, yeah, no, I know that. I love that. And I'm always yes. surprised that people know it. It's sort but of cultural, outside... Isn't it? My first encounter of it was... Um, it simply was the, the, the big box VHS rental <laughs> um, that came mm-hmm. off the uh, the mobile video library that used to come to our streets. Oh, I mean, so it, brilliant. I mean, oh. and, and my father was terribly bad at this sort of thing because i can remember a whole run of movies that he hired when this was still very exciting having you know vhs and mm-hmm. in, in the house um and my mother always saying uh, because i'm uh, as you can tell i think immediately from meeting me i'm, I'm an only child um <laughs> and uh, my mother's constant um, complaint would be are, are you sure this is appropriate and he and my father would always say ah it's fine he's watching it with us forgetting of course that there is that moment when you you, you go into your own room and shut the door and 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 the, the branches of the tree behind the house are hitting the window mm-hmm. and and you're in that moment of just before drifting off to sleep but so i had in a in a strange sort of way, I didn't know that the film um uh, in some ways wasn't terribly well known because it had been uh, it had come along at uh, a a really kind of interesting point in my yeah. life. So I thought it was just it was just out there. And I think I probably uh, I know there's a number of ways we can do this, not only by the date of its release and so on and so forth. And so, but I sort of pinned it to uh, that it must have been um sort of known as the shining is known um mm-hmm. the only thing was obviously the older i got the more people would mention the shining um uh, and then i thought well maybe this maybe this film isn't terribly well known and i think jack you just happened to make a a a, a mention of it on twitter and suddenly it all i never right. got that film that film that i watched um with my parents so long ago and that very very strange child thing as well where even though i remember the big box vhs and it has the classic artwork on the front mm-hmm. with uh, joseph and and, and the wheelchair uh, the but wheelchair, it was actually yes. the photograph on the back which uh oddly unsettled me more and it's it's simply um a, a, a photograph of black and i think it's a black and white photograph anyway of um uh george c scott and um uh, Trish van der Veer but the half of the photograph that Trish van der Veer is is depicted on is overexposed mm-hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> that childhood thing of then thinking until I rewatched it um, I got it in my head that at some point she died and came back um, and sort of but actually what I was doing was I was filling in the blanks with this actually quite ropey photograph they chose <laughs> the, the big box oh, that's VHS. brilliant yeah that so happened so much of, in that era that, uh, i'd sort of jammed in my own memory of it which of course on re-watching it years later thought, oh that's not even there it's <laughs> not, yeah, it just doesn't occur doesn't occur but it, it is a very common thing uh, with regards to vhs covers of the era if you look on vhs covers for things like hellbound for example hellraiser 2 there's a photograph on the back of that which definitely isn't in the film it's from a, a cut scene in the film yeah <laughs> the, the 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 scene um with um uh, pinhead wearing the surgical mask that's exactly yes. it and, and yes. from yeah. since and then it spawned this legend up until the advent of the internet it spawned this legend that there was a scene cut from hellraiser hellbound that was so horrible so vile <laughs> that they couldn't put it in it's not the reason at all it's it just didn't work mm. the effects they were going for were just terrible and it just didn't work so they cut it that was it but but that image i, I remember that so clearly that mm. image of pinhead and i think also the female centibite right. standing next to him wearing the hospital scrubs that's such that's a wonderful it. image it's a great but image, it's really quite 
it's wonderful. It's really quite uh, cruel of them to put a put a picture of that <laughs> on the box, and then it's yeah. not in the fucking film. <laughs> it's not in the film at all because it just didn't work. Apparently, the the special effect just did not work. It looked terrible to hear people say but uh, the thing i mean the changelings box art is really strange as is all of the advertising material for this film because it's advertised as a horror film which mm. i find kind of bizarre watching it now because although it has it utilizes the beats and tropes of a almost, like, almost classic 1970s haunted house drama it isn't that it's it's this gigantic red herring. It leads you to believe it's going to be that, and then does this wonderful vault fast where it actually shifts into an entirely other arena. Mm. Yes, I'd rather flip yeah, it said on Twitter that suddenly it becomes all the president's men. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, or, or something, you know. I, I don't know why, but I mean, I, I like like yourself, I, I saw this film when I was a kid. My mother, because my mother's a huge horror fan, you know, mm. um, she taped it off, off of the television when it was it aired on British television. And I remember sitting and watching it. And as a child, I interpreted it in the same way that I interpreted like the Amityville Horror or um, Burnt Offerings, or both of which are from a sort of similar time period as another mm. haunted house story but watching it now a lot of that is gone for me it feels like a totally other work yes really, I mean, that's you, interesting because i still yeah. i still think of it primarily as a haunted house story as a supernatural <laughs> story yeah yeah i mean it's definitely there it's definitely part of it but i like the way that it takes the beats and tropes of a sort of 1970s haunted house story and then shifts them into another gear Yes, it's it's sort of interesting because one of the things that occurred to me on rewatching it was just how uh, the uh, how it does take those tropes and devices, treats them very very seriously. Yeah, um, almost to the point of um, uh, almost to the point of saying we're, we're sort of doing a high art piece here almost, mm -hmm. and but but it's to get us somewhere else. And yeah. yet, uh, what I find actually one of the successful aspects of the film is by the end um it has managed to to sort of funnel us back into um uh, the supernatural yeah. aspect of it quite successfully but yes it, it, it's a it's but i i never feel like it's a um that there's a tremendous balance on that film so you you never feel like the dog leg it is an obvious dog leg it's not a sort of no, well, now we're doing some no. narrative substitution it, it evolves yeah, how it, how it very naturally. out of the house to the other house, yeah, to, to the house with the well. Um, it's it, but there's just something incredibly careful about the the, the way it's um that that narrative progresses that you I never think the feel like help a great deal. I mean, George C. Scott has such enormous gravitas, and he, I love the way he reacts to the supernatural elements. There's there, there are moments where obviously he does question what's happening, but when it's established that it is clearly supernatural, it's clearly supernatural, and the film well, just runs yeah. with it. I think there's two things in that that I mean, where, where this film just scores for me massively on a personal level, which is in the first place, and it relates to George C. Scott's performance, um, but it's also to do with characterization and just the approach they're going for. Is that they? I I get very. It's a it's a completely subjective thing, but you know, I I kind of like things. F uh, for what they say on the tin, yeah. I don't want you to dangle a supernatural story, whether it's a film or you know, a piece of radio drama, a novel, whatever, and then try and say it isn't one, or ah, or, it's, or it's, it, it's there's an ambiguity around it. Like that. I, yeah, I I just that sort of yeah. fr quite frankly pisses me off. It's I, I know not, that's something yeah. you don't like either, Jack. Is it? Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's, that's let me let me let me just put it this way: the Babadook really fucking pissed me off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so okay, we're both on the same page. That's good. And but with um the other thing that I think this film really gets around really well. And it's in the casting of the fact that I, I think George C. Scott's that bit older. The, the character is older. And of course, he freights in a great deal of what he's done before, as all actors will yes, do. It's the fact that they eschew the, 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 the cynic, the cynical character who we've mm -hmm. got to spend 25 minutes convincing. Um, and, and, we're, and we're sort of grinding the narrative to a halt, the pace to a halt. I yeah. mean, um, and this loses it because, and I think it's really locked into that sequence with Gene Marsh and the child. He's 
he's already in a situation right at the top of the film where he's fe- he's experiencing such a profound sadness and i think it's a brilliant way that george c scott does it because he as an actor chooses to play a uh, very internalized uh, uh, the, the 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 sense of a man who has been somewhat closed down by that yeah. event, and yet what it's done underneath is it's completely opened him up. It opened him up. It's opened him up to the house. It's opened him up to Joseph, and it's opened him back up to his music to such an extent that he even becomes a medium for a piece yeah. of music. But I think the 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 great choice he makes as an actor is. Um, he just holds the line of um, uh, of presenting someone credible who doesn't have to be sceptical. Continue. Yeah, it's a very clever thing because he doesn't ever come across as sort of credulous or anything to that effect. This guy is a rational man, mm. and yet he just accepts yeah. what is evident. Yeah. There's yeah. there's the very key scene I think it's it's a very small exchange but there's the scene where he goes to the um, the university or whatever it is and he's talking to the slightly stereotypical scientist and mm-hmm. the guy says to him you know um, we can fix you up with a medium and he and he, the way he reacts so the, the guy says you know n- most mediums are frauds yeah but there mm-hmm. is there is a few but even so like John's reaction to it is oh for fuck's sake yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got to you know, I've got to have a seance now but yeah. then when when they get there. Um, of course, the experience that they don't do that um, poltergeist thing where they make the medium kind of cutesy or mm-hmm. or eccentric. I mean, it's a very normal woman. Uh, the actress gives a very restrained performance. And the whole thing has this incredible, uh, again, as you were saying before, this this intense seriousness of purpose about it that that an- announces that there's nothing to be um, to be laughed at here. And you kind of yeah. get um, George C. Scott plays into that. It's characteristic of the uh, horror films of the era as well, particularly the ones that it it sort of borrows from. I mean, if you look at films like The Omen, for example, which funnily enough has a similar thing, a similar dynamic going on where you have the older protagonist, you know, and the supernatural element, the, the horror element uh, derives from a child. Once again, kind of interesting, given that it's these are 1970s horror films, you know, they're expressing something that's going on in American yeah. culture and politics yeah. of yeah. the era. I mean, the, that's the Omen really is a, a masterclass in making, presenting incredibly cheesy material with a straight mm-hmm. face. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah, I think that's it does it brilliantly. That, um, again, lands here is that these. These devices, these tropes, um, the, the they've been around an awfully long time, even mm-hmm. in film by this point. Yeah. And the and the the um, the fact that they they do it with this, with the earnestness that they do, it, and and don't shrink back from it. Um, it is quite interesting. We're, we're still a little bit away from, oh, well, we'll, we'll be a little bit more self-aware about this because mm-hmm. maybe the audience feels it's going to be too sophisticated to deal with that. But just briefly, that that's an interesting point you just made about, if you like, uncanny kids and then the yeah. omen because you've because of course yes there's damien thorne there's um there's joseph of course there's danny torrance charlie yeah. mcgee and firestarter uh, carol ann and poltergeist this idea of what children are in, in a world i don't know it, it, it seems to be something in the air in, in the films at this time that the that, that, that there is this is a world that for somebody is no longer innocent in the romantic yeah. sense there's a sort uh, of like almost like sublimated pedophobia in culture uh, of the era you yeah know, it's almost like it's ref- it's it seems to be american culture trying to assimilate all of the worries and concerns that derive from the 1960s where of course you did have all of these youth movements you had this yeah. escalating gulf between generations and during the 1970s an attempt to grapple with that and to rein it back in Yes, and you see it measured against some such strong material situations as well, whether it's unemployment in the case of Jack Torrance or his writer's block. I mean, he's, yeah. he's, he's a fraud anyway, but yeah, yeah. Or, or the, the, the <laughs> political economic shift, you know, in the late 70s coming into the 80s. I mean, it's, it seems to be a rich vein for all these films. They have their uncanny kids. They measure them against whatever notions of what childhood is and then there is a family connected to them yeah. who are, are having some hardship with the era they're in the world that they're in um and then this 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 really very very familiar and quite old fashioned gothic imagery mm-hmm. is, is is thrust into the middle of their lives <laughs> it's, it's really fascinating 
I, I want to kind of push back slightly against the idea that this film, The Changeling, um, is so compatible with the other films uh, of its of its broad era that we've been talking about. <laughs> because I have to say that one of the things that strikes me about it is the fact that it's quite divergent. Um, <laughs> for instance, it's not about a nuclear family. Um, the the family is annihilated right. in the first scene. Yeah, whereas that is so many of the other quint quintessential films of the era, The Omen, The Shining, The Amityville Horror, Rosemary's Baby, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they are f they are intensely about nuclear families. Yes, and the, and, I mean. Um, uh, another way in which it differs markedly from them it's almost like a, a, an evolution of those films in the sense that the the pedophobia that kind of defines those films where the, the the child is almost like a symbol of malevolence you know the supernatural element is evil in this it's not no well i again i want to push back a little bit on that because i think um it, <sighs> Joseph is a the great one of the great things about this movie is that Joseph the ghost is a character he is yeah. a fully fledged yes. character and he manages to be so without having well he does he does have dialogue in the sense that he you hear words mm -hmm. that he speaks so to speak that um, that end up on that tape recording but he doesn't ever have a conversation with anybody he never emits a coherent sentence no, but in fact, you, you get can the... infer yeah, you get the impression from some of the supernatural events that occur is that this is it's uh, an entity now that doesn't know how to communicate. It doesn't have the means of communicating like a living human would. And he's trying well, very, so, so very it's hard. I mean, of course, I mean, yeah. the, the, you, the, the you, child you, aspect is something we can't forget. And he would <laughs> he is depicted as being very young. Yeah. So you get that yes. that that kind of um that angry eventual lashing out yeah um which is of course incredibly sympathetic and realistic um, within the con <laughs> within the context of what we're dealing with yeah um, yeah of yeah. course it's great because it's the ultimate case of arrested development mm -hmm. um and and that is of course one of the things that you find in adults who are uh, intensely cruel or mm -hmm. you know who who commit violent crimes is that you find an intense um emotional immaturity which is a result of uh, emotional development being arrested at a young age usually mm -hmm. through trauma neglect abuse etc well that's what this is this is this yeah. is a child this is an entity that is now very old but which has been literally arrested at a very young age at a point before emotional maturation by the worst kind of abuse imaginable and i even think in the flashback sequence where you see the, the father standing over the bath there yeah. is the faintest hint of uh, sexual abuse as well mm -hmm. as a possibility um you know there are possible other motives besides the one that john and um, claire work out from the evidence yeah. um i don't want to push too hard on that but that's a, that's an intonation that i certainly think is there whether they meant it to be or not and so what you have in joseph is an entity that is you can infer his moods and his intentions quite complex moods intentions plans desires etc from the things that he makes happen around him and i want to get on later actually to how he manifests but for the moment we'll pass over that um you, you can infer those things and he's clever he's cunning he he is he is actually himself emotionally abusive one of mm -hmm. the things he he emotionally abuses john he takes advantage of john's grief oh, absolutely and yeah, one of the yeah. reasons that john is receptive to him is that john is you know he's to some extent unconsciously he's looking for a substitute child yes. and i think john thinks that joseph might be looking for a substitute father and i think it mm -hmm. becomes clear later on that joseph absolutely is not he's no. not interested in that at no all. he's I mean, he interested. does have an agenda doesn't he he does yeah. have a very yeah. particular agenda and, and, and joseph his, his agenda is in. His agenda is one of thwarted privilege. It's yes. he feels he it's literally a feeling of entitlement that yeah. he has been, you know, this is mine. I should have, have had this money. I should have had this power. I should have had this life, this future, essentially. And I think and that it was is, taken um, from me there in two Go on. particular ways as well. Firstly, I, I absolutely agree with um, the idea that uh, uh, John is, is taken advantage of. And I think one of the clearest images we have there is the image that they you know, sort of partly lift from Fritz Lang's M, which is the bouncing ball, because that's his mm -hmm. daughters. That's not Joseph's. Yes. Yeah. That's, he, that is that's an incredibly cruel thing to do. That's manipulation. Yeah. And then secondly, um, you know, the, the, there's a certain ambiguity over it, but if we come at it from the point of view that uh, Senator Carmichael really does not know his own 
history, that he yeah. thinks he is the authentic uh, son, um, uh, then it, you know we have this act of quite cruel revenge. At the Absolutely, end. yes, <laughs> on uh, someone who is himself a victim. Of course. Yes. Now there is yeah. the, 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 the there is the possibility that he 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 may, that he he knows something or that that there's a, oh he's but whatever but uh, that's not pushed at all. Um, so yeah, I, I I do think this idea that uh, and and the fact that uh, as I said earlier, John although stoic and that's that's a choice that George C. Scott which is to play externally and I think is a good choice. Um, the the ghost gets in the joseph gets into how opened up he is mm-hmm. and there's a comment there's a line isn't it, it says, the house doesn't want people it absolutely does mm-hmm. yeah, but it needs yeah. a particular person and it needs yeah. someone like that but but i think there's also something in in the fact that um russell john russell is a is a much older father as well i mean it breaks up that nuclear family thing you were talking about jack but also you know it, it, he's uh, uh, you know it, it's sort of going into the psychology of the character as much as you can and no doubt george c scott would have this would have occurred to him his the family he has taken away from him his it, both the character played by gene marsh and and the daughter they're a much younger family and he would mm-hmm. have probably had it in his mind i will they will lose me not the other way yeah. around and i think that has this profound um effect on uh, on on how he plays his part from then on in the story yeah there's almost yeah, a ghost element long. to him isn't there in many respects it's almost after the death of his family in the first scene he is himself almost like a ghost in this world it's like he doesn't belong anymore yeah he does say doesn't he at one point the one point where scott makes the right choice to to break that 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 exterior what more do you want of me he mm-hmm. says you know he, he cries out and it's yeah. like, there it is <laughs> Yeah, yeah, looking for purpose, it seems. He feel, it seems to feel as though Joseph and the house has given him some sense of purpose. Oh, and absolutely. it is very cruel yeah. because you, you as the audience, of course, are set up to believe at one point that perhaps that whatever's happening is as a result of what happens in the opening scene, that maybe it's his, his child or his wife that are trying to come through. Mm. Yes. It's a great red herring, actually. It's yeah. a great red herring that the film plays. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, there's that that uh, it's odd because the the intentions of John Russell are, at, at first, it almost seems like, well, I've I've not got my family anymore. I do have my music. I do have my mm. work. But uh, what else is there? And it's almost like a challenge. Yeah. And then I think once um, Joseph found, has his way in, it, you know, he's pretty much pushed. Um, and it, it almost seems like a kind of almost a kind of servitude. As I say, when, mm-hmm. if that line is to be read as being a, not just an off the cuff, exasperated, frightened thing, but actually a, a real sense of I've gone to him. I've told him everything. What more can I do? Mm. Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, think, he really I does think... get the bit between his teeth as well, doesn't he? Like, he could just walk away. <laughs> he yeah. could just not bother. Uh, he could just leave the house and go and do something else. But no, he goes to incredible extremes to find out the truth. Mm. It's not clear to me that John even really knows what he's trying to accomplish. It's, yeah. uh, you know, I, I can't really make sense of what he does in terms of a, a particular um, aim in mind. It's right. like... I think to him, it's just bringing it to light. It yeah. is is what needs to be done, and that's that's absolute. I mean, that, it's it's an intensely and self consciously gothic movie. It's set in <laughs> yes. a fucking Edwardian mansion, for God's sake. Right, right, but you know that that is that is um, absolutely part of this film's gothic approach. Which you know, the classic gothic approach is the return of the repressed. It is that uh, it is the um, the knowledge that is uh, that has been buried, returning, digging itself up, so to speak. Right, quite and, and John, in this film, of course. Yeah, yeah. But John's approach is very much, um, it's like he's taking the Gothic in good faith. You know, it's claims for itself in good faith. Well, there is this buried secret. If I bring the secret out of the hole into the light, then that is the solution to the problem. And one of the great maneuvers in this is that the secret says, 
No, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's not clear to me what Joseph wants either. He just knows that what he's getting isn't enough. And I think it's implied ever so faintly that the Joseph on some level thinks or hopes that John is going to kill the senator for him. Mm. Um which of course is never going to happen. No, but, that's clearly not John's aim, is it? I mean, when it's no. made explicit in the the final scene when he actually does confront the senator and says I'm done. You know, this is the here is like everything. Joseph's, I'm done. It's like Joseph's appetite grows with the eating. You know, the further yeah. he gets, the more he achieves, the more he wants. And you know, he he achieves another thing. John mm. um, finds the finds the room, and then John finds his body, and John finds the medallion, etc. And every time, it's still not enough. You know, no, I've, I've done the next. As though thing. Joseph's power grows as well, doesn't his influence grows? Yeah. I mean, what he's doing by the end of the film bears very little resemblance to the little minor parlor tricks that he performs earlier on i mean by the end yeah. of the film he's manifesting fire and shaking the house and doing all sorts of incredible things yeah, yeah. absolutely but you there's this feeling of kind of insatiable desire coming mm -hmm. from from him you know that he he it's just every everything he gets he he sort of consumes it and then no i'm still hungry you know mm -hmm. and it gets to the point where he has to destroy um the false self the, yeah. the the substitute self um and it's still not enough because he's still there at the end yeah of course um, because they're really th this is one of the things about this film that's really very dark indeed which is that you know there is no solution to this problem right Br there's no exorcism Br bringing the problem or like that no no bringing the problem to light doesn't solve it burning the house down doesn't solve it the past being uncovered the past being mm. buried nothing solved it's just yeah, this the metaphysics of that is just moribund sore. isn't it it's really unpleasant yeah. the, su the fact, suggestion what, that somehow joseph would be floating there in nothingness when the earth burns to nothing you know as mm. would all all souls all dead things consigned to the earth not yeah, nice one of the um the things that we we do end up with and I, i'd be fascinated to know how much is uh, in in the writing I, I i don't mean in the dialogue but in, in in whatever stage direction there was or the director or just the choice of melvin douglas because when the um the, the revelation comes uh, about the changeling mm -hmm. um he himself makes the choice to take on very very childlike qualities in the way he responds i mean he mm -hmm. he 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 has this he, he he weeps he becomes resentful uh uh he 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 does that thing that's not my daddy my daddy's yeah. not like that. and now, and he is infantilized in that moment and it, it it's almost uh, there's this might be a little fanciful but there's almost this implication that that somehow joseph is leveling the playing field that um that the even the age of um of carmichael is is is, is good. but then then the, one could also make the argument about you know extreme old age and you know you're you're into your um jayquez then from <laughs> from shakespeare <laughs> but you know uh, it, that, that he he has become a child by the end yeah. a resentful child himself that he's actually joseph is, is um f fermented this kind of uh, situation where it's two kids squabbling yeah. <laughs> how dare you say that about my that's, dad he's you know? essentially broken down everything about his identity so he is operating at the level of a child at that point yeah yeah. Well, if you think about what kind of dad Carmichael Senior must have been, right. um, I think what, what we're what we're looking at is two sons of privilege, you know, mm -hmm. um, and both raised by this person who is undoubtedly profoundly toxic. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at cycles of abuse and again, arrested emotional development. I think you can see that in a way, the same arrested emotional development in um, Senator Carmichael. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know that is that is obviously dramatized and metaphoricalized and ramped up to an incredible degree in um in the in the idea of joseph the ghost and i think what the film is i think what the film is getting at there is kind of that there is just something fundamentally wrong with this setup you know the these children of privilege who live in these gigantic mansions and they they are raised not just to you know inherit money but to inherit power and position mm -hmm. in the world and there is just there is just something there's there's this little core of the of the movie that's really quite mordant and radical because it's saying you know there's some there's something fundamentally wrong with the way this is all set up if if it rests upon the the 
the the squabbling property claims of two sons of privilege who yeah. are essentially are mirror images of each other yeah. at the end. You could definitely see that in the way it. Uh, Oh, sorry. Go on. No, no. I was just going to say the the implications of of that intersection of um uh, of of the the, the potential of uh, the family line, the offspring, um, wealth, inheritance, power, but also the um uh, the, the the attitudes about um you know, simply physical disability. So, like, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. I haven't got the sum I need. Yeah. What am right, I going to yeah. do about it? So now we have the man of property. Who, of course, will 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 treat his own family as commodities. Well, I haven't got the right commodity here. I haven't got the right commodity to perpetuate my power. Mm-hmm. I've yeah, got to do something it's about damaged it. goods. Yeah, yeah. so you've it's got to take got a it back really, to the shop and get a substitute. Exactly, mm-hmm. the really strong material um, foundation going on to this backstory. It really yeah, grounds what it. What it's what it's saying is, it, I mean, it's saying ultimately that. Um, uh you know bloodline actual familial connection genes uh none of that is really what matters what no, you it's know the it, myth thereof isn't it that matters yeah and and you know it, if the if the the son is defective um if he's not going to be an effective uh property claim for you or an, you know mm-hmm. an effective uh means of transmitting property down the family line then you, you just do whatever you can and yeah. the fact that you 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 find you buy you buy a substitute that mm. is you know, nothing to do with your family line but is um you know it, its use value as a commodity is right. intact um that is is pretty powerful really well it's, it's something saying, that you know, Senator it's the maintenance of class power you can even look at it as like the maintenance of class power um yes. over anything else mm-hmm. and of course we have that you know saying that, that things being in the air i mean uh damien thorne of course becomes Obviously, connected yes. to the political establishment and but it, it did make me the i don't, I don't know it, it only just occurred to me because i think it's just that idea of the the the, the child joseph ends up down at the bottom of a well, uh, water, and then at the end we see the senator ascending through a stairwell of fire. It's like mm-hmm. a lovely little inverse symmetry, just uh, just in the imagery uh, at the end. Um, it's, it's only just occurred to me while you were talking. <laughs> yeah, there's some religious imagery going on there, but inverted, yeah. which is kind inverted, of clever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Also, I, th- I mean, at a purely metaphysical level, I was kind of taken aback by what does happen at the end with the the ultimate confrontation between Senator Carmichael and Joseph, where it's not a literal confrontation. There's somehow some implication that Carmichael is astrally projected into yeah, the he house. Yeah, locates. Because it's, it's a, really it's, bizarre. The film makes it? a point. The film makes a point of showing you that John sees him. Yes, he's physically. The, the film wants. Yes. Yeah. He's physically. The film wants still you to know office. that it's not just metaphorical. Yeah. Right, and yet he is somehow present within the house. Which again is doubling. Um, you know, yeah. the, the whole the whole setup, the two Joseph Carmichaels, the one the in the ground and the one in the. Of course, you know, it's it's yeah, it's exactly. Very clever, yeah. you know, it's all tying together. I mean, the title is phenomenally well placed it's phenomenally well placed i mean imagine someone watching this film who doesn't really know like sort of like the folkloric history of what the changeling is supposed to be i.e some mm. fey creature that steals a child and then takes its place metamorphoses into it and takes its place um watching the film saying well why is it called the changeling what yeah what absolutely the i mean that? I, I remember being quite young and seeing it for the first time on on television, um, and that was that was something that occurred to me repeatedly mm-hmm. as the film unfolded. You know, what is the title going to end up meaning? Right. Mm-hmm. Because it takes it in a very non-literal way, doesn't it? It's very very clever in that regard. It kind of elevates the folkloric implications and makes the it makes it into something entirely other. And I think this might be uh, either. Uh, logically, uh, sorry, not logically, intentionally or, or, or not, who's to say, but there must have been on, on some level, some awareness um, that, you know, OK, we're doing we're going into this genre. Uh, it, it relates to what I was saying earlier. This, this genre now has a long history, even on film. Mm. What do we do um, to make it uh, work so that the audience just doesn't get a, a, an assemblage of things that they already know. And I think this um, this kind of uh, 
grounding it in uh, or the it, rather like the the narrative dog leg which we mentioned earlier mm-hmm. uh, it, it's it's a it's and and the treating it with such seriousness it's a great way of of just uh, reconfronting an audience with something um uh, with just enough new elements that that it can stand else it else it would just be a riff on the haunting or it would Absolutely. Just, but it's not it, it takes a, a great deal from the from that and other films but but it, it just turns oh, sorry about this pun it just turns the screw that a little bit more uh, <laughs> and, and pushes it into the into that <laughs> <laughs> i'll get my coat oh uh, no brilliant absolutely <laughs> i think you're absolutely right it would be too familiar but it plays with the film familiarity doesn't it it's 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 aware enough of the tropes and the templates of haunted house fiction from this era and i think that may have something to do with the time in which it occurred i was surprised to to see that it was actually released in 1980 mm. I was really surprised by that because, of course, it, it feels like a film of the 1970s. Everything about yeah, it feels it's, like the 1970s. The drag yeah. factor um, is something between decades that I, I was only talking about recently to someone anyway. Um, I, I can't remember what the context was, but you do get that drag. I'm, I'm often quite surprised by you know someone will mention a film or something you think oh well, that must have been what 74 ish or mm-hmm. something and they say no it's 79 it's 80 it's 81 right. and that drag factor of aesthetics and and and, and uh re- you know very rarely to do de- i mean it's a it, it's a rather um obvious point that barely needs making but i'm going to make it anyway <laughs> but you know decades never start on, no. on, on the on the on the year they start and the drag factor could be anything up to five six years <laughs> you know yeah. people talk about the 60s they mean 66 onwards mm-hmm. um and i think this is similar i mean the, the, uh, just speaking from my own childhood and everything the 70s seem to be a, around for an awful long time into the 80s <laughs> <you know? laughs> they did. absolutely <laughs> certainly in terms of filmmaking because of the technical aspect of course i mean one of the things i do love about films from this era is that soft focus the slow camera movements the expansive shots the fact that nothing Mm. is touched up you know there's no sort of digitally going in and changing the lighting or anything so one of the things that i love about this film in particular is every environment has this kind of dark dirty decaying quality about it even the, like the, the contrast between the gothic environment of the house and then you get the exterior shots of like inner cities libraries museums and whatnot all of which are similarly decaying yes yeah. Kind of love it. Yeah. And even even things like uh, the, the 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 font chosen for the time. <laughs> All the, you, the, these things you, were still a bit ahead of that moment where things are branded in in, yeah. in a more obvious way. And I, I, I when I rewatched this, I the, the just the opening sequence um, of the credits coming up. I said, like, Oh my gosh! You know, this is. I don't mean this to denigrate it, but it's, it's almost like a TV movie. Yes. The way, but then everything was like that. You know, Absolutely there, true. There's this understated, um, but and and again, it, it's this very interesting period of this genre do it at this time as well of that you you go into them and and it's trying to keep a firm hand on the tiller as much as possible and not to sensationalize anything (laughs) until the moment is required but it's a little bit later it's sort of you know that little bit going towards the middle 80s where things you know you're you're going to get a horror film you're going to get a horror film every step of the way it's going to be in the 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 font that's chosen for the Mm -hmm. title it's going to be in the 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 the, the score yeah Um, orchestra uh, sting every two seconds and this is still wonderfully muted and uh, in its way and and the the use of that um because i know uh, they used that uh 17 mil wide angle lens which is exactly what kubrick had used in the shining so there's that they they seem Mm, like a little bit like cousins under the skin because of Mm -hmm. that and and you're in so many shot after shot after shot where you're in places uh i mean i know you mentioned the libraries and the museums which are but people's kitchens mm-hmm. and, and the, the the people the characters feel absolutely tiny in them they're compressed yeah. into the middle and there's, there's that so wonderful shot of the little girl's bedroom up. where the camera is apparently in the in the light fixture and you can see the entire room from above mm-hmm yeah, just that, and, and and particularly with an actor like Scott as well, who's physically big, he's physically imposing, yeah. and he is being 
continually in the in the frame in in, in the choice in the choice of that wide angle lens being kind of diminished <laughs> um and it's the, the the tension between him being diminished by the cinematography and and trying to maintain a kind of slightly tough stoic um uh, exterior it's a really good tension yeah, it's wonderful, isn't it? It actually does create ethos, doesn't it? It creates an unspoken mood. It's like the grammar of filmmaking. It's absolutely wonderful. Mm. Yes, and I do love. I do love the materiality of of filmmaking from this period. You know, mm. fi- you you look at the picture on screen and you can almost sort of feel the celluloid. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the the picture just has this this depth and and solidity and furriness to it that that modern digital video footage just simply doesn't have and as you say there's no there's not a not a whisper of CGI or animation yeah. anywhere near any of this um, the nearest you get is the is the re, is the um, reversal of the film when the medallion comes out of the ground yeah that's, that's really about the closest it, thing it? to it that's about as ambitious yeah. as the special effects get isn't it and, and one of yeah. the delights is almost that um, because it's not as well known as some of the films from the era, it therefore never quite gets the money for a remastering. And I had this wonderful, just slight hiss on, on the version I've got, even though it's a DVD version that I've got now. I, I thought, would well, not buy gorgeous. a remastered copy no. of this. No, Nor would I. No. I, I I kind of actually even resent the fact that I now have to watch it on DVD instead of my yeah. home recorded VHS. <laughs> yeah, I don't want the sharpness. I don't no. want it at all. The clarity. They, they haven't don't taken want it. it on the soundtrack. They haven't quite got that hiss off it. And it was just delightful <laughs> to hear it just, just there on the edge of my hearing. Although that, you know, that probably a you know a, a segue for sound as well because I I think the one of the interesting things that that just kept occurring to me this yes. watch was the decision to make him um a composer yeah. and because it's like hang on a moment we've got this situation where the the earliest manifestations of haunting as in the haunting is this is this banging yeah. This, um, uh, you know, and what is a piano but a hammer banging a string, mm-hmm. and then you mm-hmm. have uh, the 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 uh, the banging on the pipes and, and and so on and so forth, and then the banging of the of of the hammer on the lock when he's trying to get mm-hmm. in, and 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 um, then the the music box, which is uh, which, which it's slightly different mechanism, I know, but it's still an armature of something hitting something else, and this running all the way through. And just thinking, well, you know, uh, uh, this idea that um, Russell almost retreats into sound somewhat after the event at the beginning, and yet sound becomes the medium by which Joseph is presented to him, even when the the, the first manifestation, the first visual manifestation in water, the the um, the foley on the water is really loud, mm-hmm. really loud, and then of course in the middle section of the film with um the 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 reel to reels the recordings the automatic writing all that everything in some way relates even if it's a bit tenuous to the fact that he is involved in some way in music um uh, sound and and sound in a way also being that art form which because because certainly in the kind of music he's making, there are no words mm-hmm. that it's very difficult to articulate um, what is meant. And of course, we're dealing with a child. And as pointed out earlier about the the the, um, uh, the, the inability for Joseph to properly articulate or willingness to articulate in, in a, uh, uh, using language, except fleetingly, I just get thinking, I think this this issue with sound is probably a little bit more. Um, uh there's something more to it than i think i've ever really sort of patched into on a previous viewing i don't yeah, know it's just so throwing it in there really <laughs> isn't. That's you know great. you're absolutely right it is so deliberate making him a composer making him a musician making him attuned to sound because it makes him it's like you said earlier it makes him a medium in and of himself and perhaps yes. a, a more sincere one in many respects that a spiritual medium there's something yes. that's yes. deceptive that's more instinctive that's more artistic yeah. that doesn't have preconceptions about what is happening and more material as well yeah. um uh, one one of the interesting little 
<laughs> notes in the film is that he has students into the house to perform. I think it's a string mm. quartet in, in the yes. house performing. And the notes he gives them when they finish is we're, we're not together on the off beats. So even there, there's like this, there's this um, emphasis on rhythm, on beats, yeah. on, on the act of hitting, if you like, on the act of yeah. music as like, like, like striking. And of course that, that, that comes in again and again and again. Um, of course his job I, is to, re- is to conjure up. It is to bring back course. Mozart, Brahms. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and this time he brings, you know, he brings Joseph, but I think there's also something maybe in the, in the, um, the way that that, that that kind of job he has that is um dislocating so mm-hmm. i always get the sense that he's when he goes off to the telephone booth at, at the beginning there's that that's a sort of through line he's always dislocated from his family because that kind of work needs concentration away from people he probably had to tell his wife but he you know very probably worked a great deal from the home the original mm-hmm. family home but had to shut the doors all the time and say, oh, I've got, you know, I've got yeah. to go and I've got to go be by myself. Uh, it's just going to be me and Brahms, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and it's almost like the, 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 I, I couldn't help thinking of the telephone booth. And again, we're back to sound with the, the, the mm. sound on the end yeah. of the line. It's like going into a kind of recording studio and every time he's isolated, something terrible happens. I mean, that is really fascinating because there may also be a sort of, very loose mythological connection there as well. I mean, when you look at the, the title of the film, The Changeling, which is a reference to fae folklorism, you know, it's fairies, it's uh, the woodland entities, things like that. Often the way those creatures are pacified or purged is through music. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you sing yeah. to them. You sing yeah. to them. Um, very often, there are stories in you know, archaic Germanic folklore of singing to the fairies to uh, ward them off mm. or to prevent them from becoming hostile to you or even to channel the spirits of woods and wild places. Yeah. And there's something. Well, it goes. Uh, uh, that, 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 because apart from the beginning moment with, with, with the, the car and, and, and the lorry and the, and the telephone booth, we're not confronted by anything that feels modern again until we see that jet plane. And I'm mm-hmm. always fascinated by the camera roving around wood, 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 wood. And um, oh, we do see, we do get the reel to reel. But again, it's it, it that just pops out against all this mahogany and, and yeah. um, paper and libraries and leather. And it's really focusing on even, even the, the, the costumes of the, these muted greens and browns. And then suddenly halfway through we're confronted by the and I just met, I, on this view and going, my God, yeah, we're, we are. We are. We're, we're in 1980, aren't we? For Christ. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think it hits think whenever the, he leaves the house, doesn't it? There is a there is a sequence where he goes to a library and he's actually using a microfiche reader. Yes, <laughs> microfiche reader. Yeah, yeah, and that comes across as like high technology at this point. It really yeah. does feel like he's it, almost in a science fiction wonderland. But yeah. it's 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 recording and storage again. This is what jumped yes. out. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's a very similar thing. It's a very similar thing to what uh, you were just talking about. But what jumped out at me about this wasn't so much the idea of the music, although that obviously that's very crucial to it, but mm. the idea of media and recording yeah. and storage of information and then replaying of <laughs> yeah. information. Sort of vibrations one of, one of, almost. One, one of the things that's really fascinating about Joseph is that he... He's like a recording that has managed to start replaying itself. He yes. manifests through things. He manifest, manifests in water. He manifests in pipes. He manifests in sound. He he manifests in the in the piano, in the ball. Uh, over and over again, it's something material that that carries him like a signal, um, yeah. very much like tape. And there is an mm-hmm. there is an intense emphasis on tape, tape recording, reel to reel tape recorders in this film they come up again and again and again and they often literally store joseph himself and again that's another very 70s thing the emphasis on tape recording it really um, is and it's a parapsychological thing about of all course. the president's men and the conversation and all those other the, yeah. the conspiracy cover-up bit of this film actually invokes them slightly of course um, obviously this sort of tape as a medium whereby secrets are stored and then rediscovered that's something that's very pregnant in this era and i think 
um, that the house itself is like this gigantic recorder mm -hmm. that is that has recorded what happened there, and Joseph is like a replay of it, which yeah, um, you know uh, cross reference it's the with tape, um, isn't it? it's, it's the, the stone, stone tape. tape. I was just going to yeah. say cross reference Nigel Neal's the stone tape. Although one of the fascinating things about the stone tape is that it kind of suggests at the end that deeper, that theory is wrong. It? Yeah, yeah it um, takes it. The stone tape does that wonderful thing of taking it deeper and saying, well, actually, that does happen, but there's something even older and more yes. malevolent and intelligent at work here. Yeah. And I, oh, yeah, that, which, that gives me chills every time. I mean, I, 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 the, the changeling doesn't doesn't give me chills. It doesn't frighten me. I, I find oh, it, it does more me. fascinating more than anything. But the stone tape, that terrifies. I find it absolutely. This, this is interesting. Sorry. No, Go I was going to say, I just find it absolutely bizarre. And, and it probably says too much about me that, that, <laughs> uh, that there's something about two blobs of red video effect down mm. uh, the, the, down a television uh, studio <laughs> corridor <laughs> the fuck out of me yeah <laughs> but it's, it's the notion it's, it's the notion to me it's when it's when the uh, the lead, i can't remember ever remember her name the protagonist it's when she says there's something older there's something yes. underneath the base yeah. level recording it's like oh that's lovecraftian mm. that's yes. hideous yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And they, the fact by that wiping said away one Ooh. supernatural experience you're going to, you're going to get something you're somehow worse. waking it up as well guys I, I i think i think we should table this for maybe another time because <laughs> yeah. i would love to talk to point. you guys another time about the stone tape yeah um, i'd love to love to but i think that what you were saying uh, absolutely spot on about this um the, the, the medium and recording e i mean even the even a music box is a form of recording yes. it, it plays yeah. the yeah. same yeah. piece even though it, it operates differently from a, obviously from a reel to reel but but uh, but uh i mean even at the act of being a composer by replaying uh, i i, I as they're the composers I've referred to, because I think they're the ones, the pieces from the film, replaying mm -hmm. Brahms, replaying Mozart. Um, you know, he is himself, a, a, you know, he, he, he is in interaction with his piano, he is recording. And then, of course, just as they push it out slightly further with uh, one of my favorite sequences in the entire film, which is the automatic writing, because, yeah. um, you know, mm. the, the, and then the, the tip of the pen is, is almost acting like the, um, the stylus of a record mm -hmm. and, 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 and the paper is, is, is the shellac or vinyl, you know, it's, that's great. Yeah. Um, it's a, uh, and, but uh, you see now it's interesting that you both had a different take on one said fascinating one said, uh, because the, my first feeling watching this film again was it has a very, very, very deep sadness to it. Yeah. But oh yeah, it's uh, profoundly I, melancholy. Profound, yeah. But there are it's tragic there moments that that did unnerve me. I mean, it, it, not not so much the jump scares, although I still think the mirror sequence is very effective with the mm -hmm. um, the overturned car. But it it I got very uneasy during the um, the automatic writing sequence, yeah. even though I knew how it was going to end. But there's it, it, they 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 do that sequence through shots and editing and acting just so well. It's still um it still manages to have it w work its um its magic that that's one. one of the most intense scenes of uh, supernatural manifestation in the entire film and the fact that it's something it's joseph communicating but intently in this really desperate way mm. i think mm. that that's what does it the big loops, I think it, the, the amount of paper used, yeah. you just get on edge. You know, it's like they're yeah. going to, oh shit, they're going to run out of paper. Or <laughs> but, you know, the, 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 these these huge um, letters, you yeah. know, because they, they, uh, um, but, you know, sort of the 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 movement of the arm reflecting. You see yeah. that childish way of uh, of you know, I that vengeful, angry, yeah, shrieking, uh, isn't it? It's yeah. child shrieking, ultimately. entitlement, jo absolutely. Joseph almost becomes coherent at one point doesn't he that the things he's saying sort of follow on from each other but he he he's not getting anywhere so he descends into just you know help john yeah. help john like this and then you get the the in the other part of the seance when the 
the tin cone, whatever it is, yeah. is suddenly hurled across oh, yes. the room in frustration. There's this wonderful, and again, it's characterization of, of an intangible uh, entity, an intangible yeah. character who's not actually there. It's still characterization. You get a foreshadowing of where he's going to go where, because yeah. that's precisely what's going to happen. He's going to get to the edge of achieving something and then it just comes up against this brick wall of nothing's yeah. enough, nothing's good enough, there is no next step, and it'll turn into this maelstrom of frustration. It becomes unfocused towards the end, doesn't it? He doesn't really care who he's hurting towards the end. Mm. Yeah, he just wants to smash everything. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's just a tantrum, basically. Which, quite frankly, given the, the metaphysics implied, uh, yeah, that's that's a reasonable reaction. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. The fact that yeah. It is but this I think it does... coherent, trapped, ghostly thing that has no way out. One one of yeah. the things I love is that he's 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 very sympathetic. The character, I mean, it's tragic. You feel desperately for the, mm-hmm. for this suffering spirit, but at the same time, there is this sense of like uh, an incredibly spoiled child, yeah. um, which ties into that kind of in, that, that wider indictment of just this system mm-hmm. of privilege that I. I mean, interestingly, in just as we said before, exactly the same trajectory as Damien Thorne throughout yeah. those films exactly the same trajectory there's a point yeah, where you sympathize with him completely when he mm-hmm. finds out who he is in the second film yes uh because he doesn't want it that's one of the most interesting bits in the entire trilogy isn't it, it? Is. is that like the sequence in the second movie which is generally yeah. pretty bad but it's the sequence the, sen- the the series of events where he realizes that you know he is the son of satan right kind of i mean it's, it's not what very well you, performed but no, the actor kind of not. you know why me and it's like yeah. well yeah you would you would ask that <laughs> why yeah it's it's a wonderful moment and i wish more was done with it you know i yes. really that should have been yeah. the focus of the film that should have been the the narrative center of the film um but i you do feel for him don't you i mean it is it is a raw deal isn't it you know mm. he has no he has absolutely no control yeah, over um, that that's something that's been enforced upon him yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it it making me want to revisit Omen Two for God's sake. Uh, wow, uh, I wouldn't advise it. I mean, it's. I mean, I will say this: it's better than the Omen Three. <laughs> God, I love Sam Neill and almost anything, but bloody hell. Yeah, what a uh, that's been a while. I was just going talking about uh, because you know we're really hitting on quite rightly. I think that uh, you know J- Joseph. It is is such a, a, a character in the story that, that mm-hmm. you know it, it's not just a uh, a presence, and, you, you, and of course we have John, and of course there's this the the, uh, the need for Carmichael as well. Um, what what are your guys' feelings about um, the role of Claire, mm. Claire Norman? Um, I think Trish Van Der Veer gives a very very good performance. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you need that character so that John has somebody to talk to. I think that's largely it, isn't it? To be honest, yeah. that's yeah. kind of where she's at. And also to have the moment of jeopardy at the end, you know, there needs to be more of a threat, which is what it throws her into, of course. Mm. Mm. The the interesting thing about Claire, I think, is 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 the relationship with the mother. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then that that very interesting, just this slight. I mean, firstly, it's interesting that the mother comes to the seance, and yeah. then there's the, there's the the little exchange at the concert where you get this little hint of politics. You know, where she mm-hmm. says what you're listening to is a lifelong Republican talking about a Democrat. Yeah, this is interesting stuff. And then I think another thing that's interesting there potentially is the fact that Claire. It, it's part of the kind of um, 70s conspiracy movie twist that the movie takes in the in the in the third act, where Claire Claire is kind of um, chucked out of the 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 housing society, the preservation society mm. where she works because she's been asking too many questions. Yeah. Um, and there's this implication that it, it's never quite spelled out. But it, right. I mean, this is one of the things that gives us a clue about what Senator Carmichael does or doesn't know, mm-hmm. because he's very concerned about the fact that somebody's living in his old house. And he's got like that woman, uh, Minnie, who's his mole, yes. the Preservation yeah. Society. And he's got the cops, you know, visiting the guys. And, and, and it's like, um, you know, he must again, it's the buried awareness. You know, it's the memories that don't fit, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I, it's fitting I, into I, that very sort of 1970s paranoia as well, much. isn't it? You know, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's the Rosemary's Baby satanic cult next door kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> But it's a very thoughtful kind of, of 70s conspiracism um, because um, I don't, th- you know, I think what's being implied is that Carmichael knows something is wrong, but he doesn't know what it is and he doesn't want to know. 
and yeah, he's worried I, that somebody's he's worried that somebody's find out going to find out not necessarily because you know it'd be politically embarrassing although i'm <laughs> sure that's in there but because he just desperately doesn't want to know he wants yeah. to hang on to his version that he remembers and and you know just ignore the memories that he has that don't fit i'm mm-hmm. extrapolating like crazy but i that's how i that's how no, I, I mean read. Th- there is a lot you can infer from the little details that the film gives you and i love the fact that it doesn't really spell it out all that no. much it doesn't give you the exposition no. scene you know where you have the the sinister cabal around a table talking about <laughs> oh we must stop this or we must stop that yeah. it just drip feeds and implies which i absolutely love yeah, it's a much more mature sort of unease about um, about government power, mm-hmm. I think, than you find in a lot of the movies of this era. As much as I love a good seventies conspiracy thriller, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think this is a this is a more mature and grown up um, in a way. It's approach um, it, to it. Yeah, in a way, it's it it's as as a film that uses um, the the supernatural, the gothic, the trappings of the haunted house movie to get us somewhere. It actually subverts that part of the plot far from uh, that 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 genre if you like far more than it does um the the the, the haunted house uh narrative it's it's mm-hmm. it, it it's it's very it's faithful to the point of um uh, I, I mean it it never allows the the viewer um that the to, to laugh at the idea of it being hokey and old hat because it plays it so dead straight. Right. But once you get to the the the, the paranoia, the conspiracy, you know, it, it's actually very small scale, and um, and the and satisfyingly so because yeah. it, it could have been very easy. You know, when as soon as you see the plane and then the police are coming in and he's thinking that oh, worth this leading. Does this lead to somewhere? You know, uh, re- oh, it doesn't. Oh, how 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 good it doesn't. This yeah, is a, yeah. this is a problem, and, and that sort of leads back to why i was kind of interested to know what um any thoughts you had on claire because i think that the the lovely thing about this film is that it is so sculpted which i which i appreciate and um and you do need claire there almost as a device but i couldn't think of any way to scaffold her character at all without the film becoming something else um so on one hand you say well okay it's probably not the most rewarding role uh, for the actress in terms of agency and and, that, and, and, and mm-hmm. what she can get from the narrative. But the only way this film stays this sculpted and doesn't start veering off in, into into things which just require more plot and right. possibly the tendency to unravel, um, she almost has to become a little bit, but from our slightly more recent take on 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 um uh well uh, more awareness about uh uh uh, female characters and 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 how how they are represented and what agency they have in films it's yeah it's a trade-off but actually it i can't see how it could be any other way yeah no I, i think you just kind of have to remark on the fact that you know in the in the world in which this film was made and and to a great extent still um, did it's just um you know the idea of having this film with like an older um woman as the main character and having (laughs) claire role played by a younger man it's just not on the table you know yeah because of cultural and social assumptions yeah um yeah but I do but think she is necessary, as you say. She is she's necessary. Absolutely she's structurally necessary. necessary. Yeah. Structurally, yeah. 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 I as, mean, you, yeah. as you say, the, the only way you can make her more than just sort of a, a joist is to put a romance thing in that's more <laughs> yes. explicit than it is, or maybe yeah. part, make her part of a conspiracy, and then you're overplotting. I think so. it just gets away with her involvement in his life as well because of the the significance of the house to the historical society and whatnot. She's and the fact that you know she does get on with him. She does like him as a person, maybe not in a romantic way, but she. Likes likes him as a person so there's yeah, a friendliness there the friendship is really i mean they, they were married i think when they made this film so right. um, yeah, yeah. one hopes they were friends um <laughs> <laughs> no i think that yes they were still married at this point yeah because they I, I think they did a few films together actually yeah that's nice I think yeah. she I think she really does do a do a good job. I mean the scene I mean you were saying earlier um that you don't find it scary. I do and it might be because I saw it when I was so young but it's like right. it's one of the earliest things I saw that I remember being seriously scared by. Right. And of course that's that's absolutely precious, you know, that's that's <laughs> something to cherish for life. And it's still even though I've seen it loads and loads of times I know it backwards. I could probably recite it down to <laughs> the intonation of the dialogue and 
you know, even so, it still does. It still works on me to an extent. And one of the, I think possibly my favorite scene in the entire film from the point of view of, of, of scares mm -hmm. is the scene where Claire goes to the house when John isn't there. Now, yes, that and is goes very in. good. And this, this is the, this is also the point where I think Joseph turns yeah. from having some kind of idea that, that he's going to achieve something to just despair and lashing out because what he yep. does in this scene is just pure cruelty. It's just, mm. it's like pulling the wings off a fly. He's just making himself feel better by terrorizing her basically. Yep. And there's the wonderful, it, again, the emphasis on media and recording, he lures her further and further and further up the house by playing snatches of John's voice yeah that, mm. like john john has shouted up that in the previous scene john shouted up the stairwell and it's like joseph somehow captured the sound yeah and which again like, leads yeah. us back to that 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 through line doesn't it about yeah recorded media mm -hmm. oh. yeah and you then he chases her downstairs sort of, uh... in, the, in the wheelchair which is just you know it's yeah, yeah. It's, it's a nasty right? it's a nasty image isn't it it's uh, incredibly have, uh... nasty and vicious thing to do and she's uh, what well, you know my point originally was that i think she she plays the terror very very well yeah she does yes. it's trauma isn't it she plays yeah. it as like proper trauma she's absolutely out of it you know when it when one like, in the something like that happened to you you'd never be the same the rest no, of your you life you, you you'd be done wouldn't you yeah. i mean it yeah. would take years to get over that if you ever would yeah, <laughs> and, and in fact, I think it's a you know it is a, it is testament to uh, the the ma major players in, in this cast. They are all as actors given some, well, actually more uh, Trish Van de Veer and Melvin Douglas than George C. Scott in a way. They're given some really difficult pieces to play just through mm -hmm. reaction that could easily tip over and 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 um, you know ruin the integrity of the film because yeah. they're, they're very difficult to respond to, and both. Both actors' choices, uh, Trish Van Der Veer in that moment, and uh, Melvin Douglas at the end when he's um, he's holding the two medallions, and then mm -hmm. what happens happens. Very good choices as actors. Um, they don't undersell it, but they they hold the line. They're both yeah. very good in it. It's a very difficult thing in this mm. film as well because so much of the film is understated. Mm. So much of the film is understated. You know, there are these long, languorous moments where it's very quiet. The soundscape of the film is ironically very, very quiet when something supernatural isn't happening. Um, yes, silence is something that, you know, again, it, it's also it's something I noticed, but it's also very linked to the 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 time of 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 these kind of films and that kind of television as well mm -hmm. where you you, you th there's dead air and it's yeah. delicious the, the the fact that there is just absolute silence there's yeah. no score there's no foley um it's just la let it's just allowed to hang no dialogue yeah. i i what, rather what miss is, that <laughs> yeah i i agree what there is repeatedly is some very um eerie sound design there's like yeah there's whisper sound effects and breath sound effects on it. You know, there's sort of <gasps> noises mm -hmm. yeah. and it's very, very unnerving. There's also, I mean, it's odd as well as a film because like you, Jack, I, I, uh, I don't know, maybe it says something about me as well. I, I, I do find some of the, I, I get the cold between the shoulder blades mm. and something and even yeah. um medak the director i think that's how you pronounce it or medak um he uh he really kind of um hallmarks some moments as well there's a very very long uh, uh dolly shot and pan to the piano before the note goes down yeah but it's still you you you're there and i think it, that 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 rather intelligent uh, awareness of the audience that is watching it and the audience that has grown up um, with this kind of material in different films. Um, so he's not cheating us. He does a few jump scares later on, but we're already in the world. But mm -hmm. in the early stages, he he gently pulls us towards the, the supernatural moment. Say, oh, it, the, oh, yes, well, that key is going to go down. That key is going to go down. But the key yeah. goes down and you still go, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's yeah, a, it's I think, a tremendous I think, trick to pull off. I think that the, the film does a, does some does a very delicate thing where it, it does use familiar tropes. Although I think, to be honest, uh, I, I, again, I'm going to have to push back slightly because Please a do. lot of the things <laughs> that I see in uh, from uh, pushback against things you've you've both said earlier, uh, some of the things I see in this film are not things I've seen anywhere else before or since. To be honest mm -hmm. with you, um, 
but I mean, there's like the lovely business of the the banging noise, and then that when you find out later on what actually happened, it snaps together. Like the logic yeah. of what that actually that has a literal meaning. Again, it's it a is recording. not just random banging. It's not just pipes. a banging noise. Yeah, no, it's a, it's actually a replay of something that's recorded in the fabric of the house, like the house <laughs> is a big tape recorder. Again, yeah. but yeah, I mean, it does it does use familiar tropes, but I think what it's doing is quite is, is this quite delicate thing where to lead us elsewhere. I think is what yeah, I'm yeah and, and also to, to to show us something that's very familiar to the point of quaintness mm. but to say no you're going to take this seriously like yeah. fu- yes. funnily enough the thing that 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 sort of intrudes on my memory at this point is in rogue one um <laughs> where <laughs> like i you know like probably you two i grew up from very young watching star wars movies so it's incredibly familiar to me you know darth vader mm-hmm. striding down a corridor right and those movies are very silly very camp very aimed at children etc and then as a grown man uh, a very grown man i go to the cinema and i see rogue one and i get to the scene at the end where darth vader is striding down this corridor full of rebel troops and he's just fucking slaughtering them like uh-huh. you know he's just he just leaves this trail of corpses down this you know he's cutting people in half and chucking them across and it's to me it was incredibly effective it was like breathtaking and i think <laughs> what the film does at that point is it's saying yeah this this familiar childhood oft parodied thing that's now quaint uh we can give it back to you but seriously and make yeah. it actually work on you yeah we can breathe some vitality yeah i think yes and it does it does bend at the edges because although you you know you do have the room with the cobwebs and that you do have the the um the stairwell that, that but that utterly wonderful set for that interior of the house i didn't mm. know it was a set until i, I set, just did a little bit of a it's a set is it, it indeed is not a, wow. it's not an authentic interior of a house which i really thought it was and, and that gave me a real um appreciation for the uh the the uh the designer on that because the whole facade of the house is false as well it's <laughs> wow, overlaid really? to a real house that's um, very impressive it, it is a fiberglass an enormous fiberglass and wood um uh frontage that well they, they took over they took a, me in completely well totally, me too yeah. i mean i, I, I just assumed it, it was a it was an old house you yeah know? i read this today um just did it, a little tidbits about the the production i was like oh my god yeah that is that is a set and but one of the 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 to link to jack's point is they they do it's very simple but it, it again it's that it, it creates a tension between here are things that you do know and here are things that we are representing to you because it's absolutely flooded with light mm-hmm. um, and and it glorious sunshine and you know which is at odds with you know the cliches about you know gothic romance and everything of course. Um, but uh, of course he'd need it because you know it, it's part of his work he needs it you know yeah. uh, as would a painter he needs to work in a light box he needs to see what he's doing um it also creates gradation within the house. I mean, what you have are the the, the more external areas where the, uh, George C. Scott's character is operating, where he's living, and then as you progress deeper into the house, where the the recording, if you like, is more resonant, where the heart of it is, yeah. it gets more gothic, it gets darker, yes. it gets more decayed yeah. until going into that the point past where he, as well. yeah, where he releases it effectively when he breaks the lock and opens up mm. the room. What, yeah. the, the the sort of the staircase that goes round and round because the house is in it's it's in like four stories mm. and the, the 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 first second and third floors are linked by this staircase that kind of goes round and round in a spiral uh, it's not a spiral staircase but it goes round in a spiral shape around the floor yes. and it's it's it, i mean it's just very much like the the uh, the maze in the shining it's very much a metaphor for you know the the labyrinth of the consciousness even, yeah, even the yeah. cerebellum I mean, if you derived like. from so you're climbing up into course, the, you know very mm-hmm. yeah very much so yeah. derived from but the whole i think thing. I think part of why this works is that it's imbued with character. Again, the thing I keep coming back to is that yeah. Joseph is a character in this film, despite the fact that he never has a full line of dialogue. You never see him interacting physically with anybody. He Everything that happens in the film, it, you know, that is supernatural is an act. It mm-hmm. is an act that has a meaning. So you infer character. And when by the time you get up into that attic room, you're aware that you've been led there, like from the from the glass smashing outwards. That and that yeah. particular pain is chosen so that John can identify where it came from, all the way up to the point where he gets he finds the secret door, and it's like 
air comes it, like wind comes through the gap at the top and it's like breath uh -huh. at every stage you know you're conscious of the fact that something has been saying come on come on higher yeah yes. Higher. yes like find me that's that's why this is sort of a you know musty old room with cobwebs etc mm. i think that's why it works because unlike stuff like the house on haunted hill which is lovely i love that mm -hmm. but unlike stuff like that it, it feels characterful it feels yes. like there's an intelligence it's done for a reason it, there is intention yeah. yeah yeah and it's interesting because uh, when i came to the end of watching it this time and i thought well you know it is 1980 this was uh, you know and we sort of know what what happens next well actually what had started to happen anyway which is the 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 um the horror genre would go in you know, more and more into slasher picks and then mm -hmm. slightly more meta um aware, you know very aware pieces and uh comedy horror and so horror on. becomes obsessed with the idea of humans as meat yes for, exactly. for interesting yeah. so cultural back, reasons back well to, to think that this occurred yeah. a year after alien yeah i i find that yeah. very difficult to to grasp if i'm perfectly honest yeah. It does seem, yeah. you know, yeah. as I say, it's that drag factor where certain things are behind other things, but we don't know the other things are pointing the way forward yet because they've almost got to catch up with themselves. <laughs> but it was um, the, the thing. Yeah. The thing that always fries my brain is that there's, there's only like four or five years between Frankenstein and the monster from Hell and Star Wars. So cooking, oh. you know. <laughs> yeah. oh. I know it's it's incredible. It's so the, bizarre, isn't it? It's yeah. so bizarre. But, 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 but sorry, uh, I was saying. just thinking about where, you know, in a way, The Shining and uh, although The Shining is somewhat different. It, 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 the, the Changeling is, is um, it's more obviously anchored down into, d despite what we've said, you know, it's more ob it, 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 superficially, more obviously um, bolted down into a, a haunted house thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's like, where, where do we end up with this genre? And the only thing I could sort of think of that wasn't, you know, just riffing on the same thing, and uh, uh, um, was eventually, I guess, what happens in the way that the the, the haunted house movie um, uh, evolves, mutates, probably is David Lynch, where the films themselves become haunted. That's yeah. the uh, that's the next step. You know, the edit of that's, a film yeah. or, Ultimately, or the, the set evolve, of a film yeah. becomes, and I thought well, that's very, you know, that, that's I, and then you think, well, how do you could 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 something like the changeling be done now in, in i don't mean in the same way in terms of it, the, the context is but you know can you be that head on mm. um can you be that uh, earnest mm. with a haunted house story now and have it work in the yeah. same way because I, one of the I it's a powerful film and one of the things that seems powerful about it to me is it almost seems like the end of something yeah the end of a of a of a of a trajectory uh, of a particular mm. kind of film mm -hmm. and that which also taps yeah. into that sort of sadness and that sense of yearning <laughs> that it seems to exist yeah, anyway the, the autumnal aesthetics everything mm. you know the leaves are all dying mm. and it's raining and yeah which is it almost yeah, feels no. like it this saturates. is the last of its kind <laughs> yeah but and that's it does every yeah. haunted house film from this era like not 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 just one or two all of them mm. every single one of them that yeah. is a well, it's a visual shorthand what what happens? Of course, I think you, you're absolutely right to, to call on David Lynch. I think like if you if you're looking for genuine spiritual successors to this, you have to go to stuff like uh, Firewalk with Me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but what happens also is there's there's a bifurcation, um, and you end up with films that try to do this and the only way they can do it is is via what frederick jameson called blank parody where <laughs> you know he was talking about star wars kind of doing doing um uh, flash gordon etc but yeah. but straight you know yeah, um, yeah. without parody without the joke mm -hmm. Um, and I think what you end up with now, once you've been through all the basically the dreck um, in you end up with stuff that tries to hark back to this, this air of seriousness, etc. And the only I mean, stuff like the conjuring movies, the only way it can do it is by conjuring up, ironically enough, the aesthetic markers of the era that people now associate with this mm. style of film. Yeah, they have to be set in the 70s. People have to be wearing flared trousers, etc. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I actually yes, have, kind of, I have a way. soft spot for the first couple of Conjuring movies, but they're not good in the same way. They're that not this good. Is. <laughs> they're not good. No, I, I the Conjuring is a really weird one for me. I, I everyone in the hor in the horror uh, community went nuts when the Conjuring came out. I was like, oh, interesting, interesting. I'll go, I'll go and see it. So I did, and I was never so bored in my entire life 
I'll know, be honest. No, I, I quite was never like so it, but it, you know, uh, I'm not the blind to physics is dull. The, I just couldn't get on with it. I couldn't. And also, oh, no, I don't. I think. I think the Warrens, the Warrens metaphysics well, is, you know. You, well, this is the problem because the Warrens are. I mean, as your own article in Ginger Nuts of Horror pointed out, they're dreadful people. Dreadful. But their take, <laughs> their peculiar version of Christianity is is entertainingly bonkers to me. Yeah, so. yeah, that, that that weird sort of Gnosticism they've got going on, but which is not even like classic Gnosticism. It is bonkers. It is absolutely insane. Um, yeah, it's more like a kind of reactionary pantheism or it's animism. It's so something. strange, isn't it? It's so yeah. hard to pin down. The other the other thing actually just popped into my head that, that could be seen as like a successor to this, particularly with the emphasis on recording and media is the ring. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Yes. Things like the Blair Witch Project, the ring, where you have like haunted media. You actually literally have yeah. haunted media. Yeah. Um, where Which I guess almost... where I was sort of, um, yeah, I was thinking uh, along the line with Lynch that he, yeah, uh, but yes, you can see where it branches off. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. You know, I mean, you have the notion. I, mean, I suppose it's it's solidified in Ghost Watch. You ever remember Ghost Watch from nineteen ninety two? Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where Which my mother the... absolutely um, killed for us. I mean, she <laughs> killed for us as it was coming on because mm. the actress playing the mother in Ghost Watch. Yes. She, said she was in Morse the other night. Yes. And she yeah, absolutely ruined exactly it for me. Exactly and so the it was same like, thing. And I was like, oh, my, my mother did oh, exactly the same that's thing. So fascinating. And oh. and it kills you because I was, I mean, I, I guess I was about 12. I would have been perfect to have been. Right. To, to have been like really oh, got yeah. the free song from us and she, and she just killed it in the first 10 minutes of course I've been forgiven exactly her one deep that. <laughs> she did exactly that but as a result of that we didn't buy into the hysteria that claimed the rest of the country we just started watching it as a as a well, ghost exactly story as we did. so now it's so fascinating when I hear about people of sort of my age our, our generation um, it, and I think oh god I didn't experience any of that at all mm -hmm. we, it wasn't our um, no. uh, Theatre, HG Wells, nope. uh, Awesome Wells moment at all. It might have been for I... you guys, or whether this is an apocryphal thing. But no, my mum killed it. <laughs> yeah, likewise, likewise. <laughs> I don't, I don't know about this because it's one of those things everybody now claims to have been taken in by Ghost yeah. Watch. Mm -hmm. And I watched it at the time on first broadcast. I was there. Maybe it's because I was a little bit older, or I don't uh -huh. know. But I never, I never thought it was real for a second. Apparently and I can tell you, did, though. I mean, I've. Spoken Apparently. to Steve Volk, the writer, and he he is adamant that the BBC switchboards were absolutely flooded. They could not; they, the switchboards well, broke down because I'm, and they I'm had, honestly they not had doing. To, had to go on to there was a children, you know, the who, <laughs> Sarah Brightman, the the CBBC presenter. She had to go on CBBC the day after and say, "I'm fine. I didn't get dragged into." <laughs> yes, I remember that. Yeah, I remember you know? that. Yeah, because yeah, children were yeah. freaked out by it, adults were freaked out by it. The yeah. problem was people got so freaked out by it, they turned it off. If they kept watching towards the end when Parky gets possessed, then they would yeah. have <laughs> you know, that's, like, that's oh. one of the things that happened with the War of the Worlds, because people mm. people who believed it was happening turned it off and, and yes. got into their cars and headed for the hills. Right. And actually, it's not all that long into the show when it becomes obviously theatre, because yeah. like Orson Welles narration comes in. Right. But they didn't hear that bit. Who I have to say, or people, it, people switched it, it, over it, to the ventriloquist or something. <laughs> it, it it occurred there was a point, and I don't know where this came from. Because I was I was watching the change, and I thought, my God, this film would be fascinating with Orson Welles playing the lead at that <laughs> point in his life. That would be a fucked up film. <laughs> ah, the friends. That would yes, have been would nuts. Be it just, it just occurred because I thought, you know, the, the 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 kind of performance George C. Scott is is giving. <laughs> thinking who were his contemporaries and i thought oh my god can you imagine orson doing this oh, film? Orson Wells that, at that time what the hell would that be like <laughs> that would be amazing i almost it would want be a to, completely different film it. oh a totally it would be, different film it would be it would like, have a different place in cinema history that's for damn sure it certainly would it's so uh, i love orson every, i'm a uh, excellent I'm, I'm a huge a huge Orson fan and I'm a vehement defender of his acting chops as well yeah. I don't think he would have been capable of doing this without yeah. you know almost almost literally winking at the camera at well it, it, it would be, it was at that point as well where and unfortunately it happens to a lot of actors where yes. uh, the, the, the things that are the harmonies to their acting melody everyone wants you to repeat the harmonies 
and then uh-huh. you just yeah. become a collection of uh, of ticks and, and and you know uh but but i agree you know because in his uh, in his earlier career he yeah he was formidable but oh, just, superb. Had, i think he would have been a camp classic if <laughs> he also would have been very 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 drunk at this point oh absolutely like yeah. all the time all that paul masson <laughs> <laughs> well i can't i, I that, but it, it every time I mean, it kills Celebrated. I don't think George C. Scott was exactly dry. <laughs> no, no, no. But um, their 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 uh, their ability to deal with alcohol took uh, different forms. Yeah. <laughs> Mark- <laughs> <we> say? <laughs> Markedly different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no, sure laughs> I mean, how do you top that? Yeah, it just, I just, I just had this image of Orson at that point sat at the piano, and I just sort of, I mean, I started to giggle, and I thought that would be some fucked up version of the Changeling. If, <laughs> that would, if, it, it would be incredible. I almost want to see it. I want to yes, see the alternate it, universe where this it, happened. It needs its kind of Todd yeah. Browning Dracula plus Spanish version, where you get the, <laughs> you get both. <laughs> <laughs> they just made it in secret and sold it to the uh, the, the Spanish markets. <laughs> I mean, I, again, the fascinating thing, George C. Scott, 10 years later, looking exactly the same, by the way, doesn't look like he's aged a day in uh, doing giving a performance of exactly the same gravitas and earnestness and seriousness in Legion. Mm. Incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah. yeah. And of course, the, the, the changeling itself with its... Um the story behind the story you know that that he was drawing on uh, you know alleged uh, experience yes. I, I was reading this earlier apparently the the guy who wrote the changeling claimed that so, it's obviously this is a film it's an exaggeration but it's based on things that happened to him mm. although the sequence of events surprised me how close the film right. started to feel, geez man that wow that all happened to you yeah I, <laughs> It's sort of like, why can't I have this kind of experience? I've been looking for ghosts since I was like six years fucking old, and I've never seen a damn thing. I was just gonna, I was just gonna ask you if either of you have ever seen a ghost. No. So I've, you've already I've, answered. Oh, I've been everywhere. I've been everywhere. I've been to every so-called haunted location in the UK. I've been to the ruins of Borley Rectory. I don't know, and I can't find anything, and it annoys me. It's, I, it's interesting because I, I, I haven't put um, uh, I, there is a, a kind of an interesting story um, doesn't directly relate to me. Um, and uh, my, my dad, in a civilian capacity, um, his work uh, was attached to the Royal Navy. And there was a point where he and uh, several of his work colleagues and their families were invited to go out to Gibraltar. There was a job in Gibraltar, but it would have meant going out there for about six to nine months. And quite a few took it. It was very, very good money. But um, uh, my mum was a bit unsure about you know, moving there. And uh, you know, she, she had a, 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 a elderly parents and everything. So we didn't do it. But years later, um, when when they sort of well not years later months later when when the various other people came back and of course they were in their social circle um my my mum caught up with one of her friends who did go out there and you know how, how was it all and there was this whole thing about not wanting to talk about it not wanting to talk about anything oh. to do with gibraltar and what was oh this is uh, getting good uh, yeah. was eventually found was that um the 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 the, the, the partners, the women partners, the wives, were very, very bored there. I mean, it is only a rock <laughs> and some monkeys. And then certainly then, I mean, we're talking about maybe 1982, 1981, 1982. And they started to do things, various things. And, they, and one of them was very interested in, um, you know, the supernatural and everything. And uh-huh. they, they, they alleged a, a very, very bad experience. Oh, wow. Um, but one, uh, this particular one friend of my mum said, um, my mother always said the the fact that she so desperately didn't want to talk about it. So the, the you know you would you would get a, you would expect a few tantalising hints if there was yeah. a, just nothing. It was like they they and none of them ever did, and it was a sort oh, of that's subject. fascinating. And and of course my mother being uh, you know it sounds rather like your mother sort of fascinated by things like um, the sort of woman stopping, that would spoil a ghost watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> spoil ghost watch. Yeah, the ah. we haven't got the same mother. Have we? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yes, she, she was well, that'd be a third act twist. Yeah, oh, my God, now that, that would be fascinating. What, what happened when you were a baby? You were switched over for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh... Um, 
Yeah, but uh, there was always this like, uh, I remember occasionally say, I wonder what happened out there. I wonder what happened out yeah. in Gibraltar. They won't talk about it. They're all. Uh... Wow. <laughs> so that's the closest. Either, but but personally, no. God, there's a storm uh, well, there, the... isn't there? That's mm. the best kind. It's all suggestion. Yeah, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. To this day, as well. I mean, they're, they're still, uh, you know, friendly with. Uh, and oh, it's no, it's not, yeah. it's not meant. Or it's, it's quick thing. shut down. It's a conversation. Right. So it's so yeah. disturbing. That, mm. that that's fascinating. I love that. Absolutely love that. Mm. It always mm. happens to other people. It's so I annoying. Know. And that they won't tell you. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> that's great. There's, there is uh, supposedly a ghost in the village where I live. Um, she's supposed to be called Abigail, um, a, a young woman in a white dress who is seen walking uh, in the road in the village at night around the wow. crossroads. There's actually a oh, crossroads wow. at the top of the village, and she hangs around. the. I've never seen her, and I, 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 apparently my grandfather saw her once. Oh. Um, and uh, apparently in in the old rectory, she she um, knocked a laundry basket off the top of the stairs once, according to somebody. Um, and also, uh, I, I lived in a I lived in a house when I was a kid where supposedly weird things happen. I've been told mm-hmm. that, you know, people were in the house on their own and they heard somebody jumping on the bed upstairs, you know, Ooh. and they they know for a fact that the, the bed was made and they get up there and it's all ruffled and, and things like Ooh, that. But, I like that. I like that. It's good, isn't it? Like yeah, it's that. the closest good. I've ever come. We like That's that, what know. I want. That's what I want. I mean, in my in the town where I live, you're supposed to be able to see Roman legionaries at some point in the summer walking up the uh, the local street, the Watling Street, which is an old Roman road. Uh, never seen them, obviously. 